architectural tools and techniques, the te tools and techniques of the research. And I think you've really started that conversation off brilliantly. And also I enjoyed um, how there was a bit of an overlap between um, Wilfred's uh, lecture last night about uh, where he was using drawing to explore his idea of geometry and um, you know and how he brought that in in an overlap with yours or like a, you know a tracing overlap and I also really enjoyed this discussion around the word trace which I remember from uh, the French is quite a complicated word to translate from English from um, um, a Latin based language into English because it has so many so many more connotations I think doesn't it tracé um, than it that it means in English so that was great too that everyone was totally fascinated by your your idea of trace and it's a great word for the way you were discussing this this idea of an accretion of memories and um, observations that, that become something so thanks that was great um, are, uh, is everybody here are all the people who are in um, session 3a here um, because I can start um, so yeah, great, great, um, great uh, introduction to our session. And I think also yesterday, um, when in the session that was talking about the tools and techniques of the architect of the uh, discursive practice, also brought in some very interesting ideas that we can develop today, um, moving well beyond the idea of writing being an outcome or a tool of research. Um, you know, Pallas and uh, Wilfred have both introduced the idea of making diagrams and drawings and overlays and juxtapositions. Um, you know, so, you know, when I look at the title, I have the question, what is a tool and what is a technique? And I think this has started to be answered. Like, you know, a tool moves way beyond what we think tra traditionally is a tool, you know, the pen or the mouse and becomes something m more conceptual. And similarly, the technique, you know, is how we, how we wield that tool. Um, you know, what are the procedures um, that, that that tool implies? And I think, yeah, great. So um, I'm going to just uh, introduce the three speakers this morning. I'll, I'll introduce all three of them so that they can do their papers consecutively and then we can have a discussion at the end. So the first paper um, is by Jana Kulek and it's called Examining Utopias, Comparative Scales as a Disciplinary Research Method. I think something that's very interesting about Jana's paper is that she's using drawing to investigate um, um, two different representations of utopia. So Jana Kulik is a Croatian architect and urbanist living in the Netherlands. She's a founder of Studio Fabula, a Delft-based architecture and urban planning office, which focuses on narrative-based design methods. Since 2018, She's been a PhD researcher in the Chair of Methods and Analysis at the Faculty of Architecture in TU Delft, where she also teaches. Um, as you will see in her fascinating paper, she's investigating utopias as a critical method in architecture and literature. Um, our second speaker this morning is Enrico Miglietta, and his paper is called Moving from the Fragment, a rereading of form through the agency of the joint. Um, Enrico Miglietta is reading for a PhD at Milan Polytechnic, from where he graduated in architecture in 2016. In 2020, he was a visiting doctoral research associate at KU Leuven, and alongside his professional activity, he has worked as a GTA within international design studios at the um, architecture school at Milan Polytechnic. His research, which we'll hear more about today, analyzes the relationship between architecture and memory preservation and regeneration of the culture of cultural heritage. Sarah Mendes, um, is, her, pa her paper is called The Building is Present, the one to five model as a tool for research. Um, and Sarah Mendes is an architect, writer and researcher based in Rotterdam. She studied architecture at TU Delft and TU Berlin and philosophy at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Since 2013, she has been a lecturer and researcher at the Chair of Interiors Building Cities at TU Delft. She's also a visiting lecturer at the Rotterdam Academy of Architecture and an editor at the Platform for City Culture de Dépendance. She was a co-editor of the 13th Architectural Review Flanders and of the publication The New Craft School. She's a member of the editorial board of OASA and co-founder of Dutch Architecture Podcast, 
Bindu. <laughs> I hope I said that right. Anyway, um, I introduce now Jana. Or, um, is she here? I'm here. Yeah, fantastic. Yes. Great. I'll give you the floor. Thank but, you. Uh, okay. Can you see the title? Yes, very good. Okay, perfect. Very good. So, uh, good morning everyone and thank you Helen uh, for the introduction. So, um, in my presentation today, I will talk a little bit uh, about the method that I developed uh, in order to analyze and compare uh, utopian works from architecture and literature in, uh, in my doctoral research. Uh, but I will also talk about some of the issues and the complexities which I encountered. And uh, since uh, there is a, a limited time to explain all this, I will use uh, one of the case studies that I'm working with, uh, so case study pairings, that of uh, Ludwig Hilbersheimer's uh, Metropolis Architecture and uh, Yevgeny Zamyatin's uh, dystopian novel, We, uh, as a way to kind of uh, visualize uh, the method and to show you how it's uh, enacted basically uh, on an actual case study. So developing my work uh, between the borders of what is considered a traditional architectural practice and academic research, uh, my curiosities actually began with one of the most prominent tools uh, of the architectural discipline, uh, that of the drawing. And specifically the ways in which drawings uh, can be used as critical tools, uh, as methods of creating, containing and transmitting knowledge, and uh, as objects which develop uh, architectural narratives. And uh, the interest in the interrelation of drawing and text and how they can be used to develop architectural thought and present uh, ideas and to create also uh, critical positions has led me to investigate a very specific uh, set of projects, uh, utopian ones. So in the context of my research, uh, utopia is seen as a critical and speculative method, uh, an unattainable ideal, uh, which is not meant to be achieved, but uh, which rather serves as an ever-moving goal towards which we strive. And it serves as a means uh, for social imagination and as a hope uh, for a better uh, or a different future. So in order to uh, better understand and identify uh, the tools and the critical and speculative methods which architecture uses to produce its own utopias, uh, my research creates a comparative analysis of the architectural utopias uh, with the ones from the literary field. And this has allowed me to approach a more diverse and open field of knowledge uh, and has prompted me to move past the boundaries of my own discipline in order to track the possible uh, roots and correlations of the ideas that uh, the utopias propose. Uh, but instead of looking only at the works uh, as a whole and comparing them, my interests uh, grew uh, to also include several other questions, such as uh, how and with what elements uh, are these fictional words, worlds constructed, uh, how these elements respond or relate to the real historical ones, uh, and consequently, what are the most common social and spatial forms uh, which are used in the utopian projects, and what types of changes they propose or instill on our environment, and do they differ in architecture as opposed to literature? So the context uh, where the works were created also comes into play. And so looking uh, into the proposed utopian elements, but also how they relate to the same scale elements of their historical contexts, uh, has allowed me to see what types of utopian changes lead to what types of results uh, with the aim of identifying which uh, of these social and spatial forms shape the utopian worlds and which are in turn uh, shaped by utopias. Uh, however, uh, examining uh, utopian works from two fields, in my case, uh, architecture and literature, uh, I found myself searching for uh, uh, an appropriate method of comparison, uh, since established comparative methods which are used uh, in either field were insufficient, uh, given that the various uh, differences in both uh, the approaches uh, and the outputs of the works, uh, as well as what is actually considered a uh, utopian work in each field. So while literary utopias are created as fictional texts uh, with uh, rarely any graphic representation, uh, in order to describe uh, the imagined world, uh, the various changes uh, which the work proposes in relation to our reality uh, are depicted mostly on the level of social interactions uh, rather than the spatial conditions, while the built environment is described uh, through the narrative as a set uh, in which the plot itself unfolds. Um, on the other hand, uh, the architectural utopias are presented mostly through drawings uh, and generally focus on the spatial changes uh, of different scales, 
uh, while the population is described in total and in relation to their interaction with the built environment, if uh, at all, actually. Um, however, very few non-utopian literary genres uh, trouble themselves with uh, constructing alternative worlds uh, and, setting, uh, uh, and settings whose ambition is uh, to better the status quo, but uh, virtually all architectural projects operate based on that principle. Uh, so while it might be easier to define what constitutes a literary uh, utopian project, defining what constitutes an architectural one uh, has proved itself a bit more complex. So I found that the most general aspects uh, which define utopian works across both fields is that they propose a critical and innovative alternative uh, to their historical perspective, which is built through a strong presence of both social and spatial elements and forms. And uh, you can see here uh, two of the main uh, definitions that I was working with, one from uh, Francois Shaw from The Rule and the Model, and the other uh, from uh, Nathaniel Coleman, who has written uh, extensively about uh, architectural utopias. So while spatial forms uh, are a concept which is easy for an architectural crowd uh, to understand, uh, social forms in this context require a bit uh, more explanation. Uh, so here uh, I built uh, on the work of the literary theorist uh, Carolyn Levine uh, and her book uh, Forms, a uh, Whole Rhythm uh, Hierarchy and Network, where she proposes, uh, and I quote, uh, broadening our definition of form to include social arrangements also, end quote. So for Levine, uh, forms are strongly connected to politics and uh, she defines a form as, I quote, all shapes and configurations, all ordering principles, all patterns of repetition and difference, uh, and views politics as a matter of distribution uh, of di distributions and arrangements of imposing order on space, organizing time. And she concludes that politics involves activities of ordering, patterning and shaping. So the combination of both uh, social and spatial uh, elements becomes a key to bridging the gap uh, between the two fields and including both uh, social and spatial aspects of the work. Uh, the method allows for the identification of the various isolated or overlapping building blocks, uh, which can be compared. From an architectural perspective, uh, these al this allowed me not only to identify the spatial elements proposed through the drawing and described through the text, but also uh, to identify the societal consequences that these spaces impose. Uh, it allowed me to analyze how these elements uh, also overlap and influence each other. Uh, However, to bridge uh, another of the initial issues uh, of comparing works from two different fields, where the mediums uh, through which the works are presented differ, uh, the comparative analysis of the social and spatial forms also allowed me to break down uh, and identify the various utopian elements, which opened the possibility of visualizing or drawing them. So drawing them becomes an integral part uh, of the comparison, working together with the text uh, to depict and interpret the utopian conditions and through a sort of reconstruction uh, of the missing elements and pieces uh, based on the possibilities and affordances of, a different, of the differing uh, social and spatial forms from both works, uh, I was able to perform a, a visual and textual comparison of different utopian building blocks. So while the textual comparison focuses on written narratives and related historical, philosophical, uh, literary and architectural writings, uh, the visual analysis was created uh, using both uh, newly created analytical and interpretative drawings, as you can see on this uh, image, as well as the original drawings created by the utopian authors themselves, which were accompanying the original architectural projects. Uh, but dealing uh, with the notion of comparison itself, uh, I encountered some other issues, uh, such as the fact that comparison uh, can lead to creating a power relationship between the examined objects, uh, which sets one uh, as inferior to the other. So as explained by another literary theorist, Susan Stanford Friedman, comparison also decontextualizes the compared texts. Uh, this poses a danger in, in the case of my research of either uh, positioning the historical context as the dominant conditions, uh, which diminishes the importance of the utopian uh, proposal, or uh, it positions works from one field uh, as somehow more relevant to the other, which I wanted to avoid. 
So in order to avoid these negative consequences, Friedman proposes the concept of juxtaposition uh, as an alternative to comparison, which uh, I quote, sets things uh, being compared side by side, not overlapping them, not setting uh, one up uh, as the standard of measure for the other, and not using one as an instrument to serve the other. She proposes uh, three main juxtapositional methods, namely collision, defamiliarization, and collage, uh, of which I found the collision and collage to be most appropriate ones to use within my research. So while collision, according to Friedman, uh, allows for multiple voices to be heard in parallel, uh, collage also allows for viewing different elements together with our cultural and historical backgrounds and contexts, uh, with the aim of producing various new insights about the works in particular, as well as creating overarching theoretical frameworks. And this is again where the context of the works uh, comes in as a, as a way in a third element uh, in the comparison. Uh, applied to my own research, uh, the juxtapositional method plays out as a comparative relationship uh, between the architectural and literary utopias, as well as their historical contexts. So not only uh, do, they, do they allow for a leveled comparison of several parallel conditions, uh, it also allows for comparison of different forms within the works themselves and breaking the works down into different uh, generative forms, uh, each responding or relating to a specific condition of their historical context, uh, has allowed me to further uh, level the playing field uh, between the architectural and literary utopias, as well as their contextual relationships. And this way, instead of performing an immense uh, historical overview, uh, which in the end only positions the works within their contexts, I am identifying and juxtaposing a constellation of uh, real or fictional ideas, uh, which are social or spatial, and which were brought about either within the works or within the respective contexts. And colliding and collaging, uh, these ideas uh, build a collection of forms, which, I ha which have then, in one way or another, uh, shaped our, our social and spatial environment. Um, acknowledging that the various social and spatial forms which I have identified within the works differ in size, uh, both on a purely spa spatial level as well on the scale uh, within which they operate. Uh, I have divided the, the compared elements into three predominant scales, so small, medium, and large, in a very architectural manner. So the small scale focuses on the individual and their surroundings. The medium scale looks at groups and communities and other forms of human organization, as well as uh, their habitus, such as building the street uh, and uh, yes, the street scale. And the large scale, which is focused on larger populations, such as those of nations or even the global scale, together with the city and the planet. Uh, although uh, social scales are mostly focused on living beings and their interaction, uh, they can also include elements of ordering and arranging these interactions. This is where the social forms then come in. So aside of looking at uh, people or other beings, the social scales examine uh, formal and informal groups, such as uh, political, religious, administrative, and other groups, uh, collective and societal systems, such as educational, political ones, uh, as well as societies and societal structures in general. Uh, and the analysis of social scales also uses abstract notions related to uh, societal and individual interactions and states of being, such as uh, alienation, fragmentation, uh, commodification, etc., et uh, to describe the conditions of the examined elements. Uh, each uh, social scale uh, has its spatial counterpart. Uh, which embodies the environment in which the social forms take place. So therefore, the small scale, as I said, focuses on the habitus and the immediate surrounding on the individual, uh, such as the house or the apartment. The medium scale investigates more complex forms of architecture, encompassing not only housing, but various types of public buildings and spaces intended for human interaction. And lastly, the large scale investigates the city, either as a confined, bounded whole, uh, or as an endless system of repetition. And aside from the more obvious uh, forms, such as objects of daily use, living units, buildings, or cities, the spatial scale also analyzes the changes in the non-built environment, such as changes in nature, the flora and the fauna, and depictions of uh, differing Earths or new planets. So, and depending on the specific case study, the framework can be, of course, also extended to include the extra small or the extra large, ranging from uh, use objects to interplanetary relationships. 
while it may seem uh, that distributing the various utopian and contextual forms uh, throughout different scales would go against the possibility of understanding them and how they're connected, uh, correlated or how they overlap, it is actually, I argue, quite opposite. Uh, taking as an example uh, the children's book uh, Cosmic View, The Universe in 40 Jumps uh, by the Dutch author Kees Boeke, uh, or perhaps uh, the more well-known uh, film Powers of Ten by Charles and Ray Eames, uh, we see uh, that uh, actually distributing objects throughout different scales allows us to see their correlation. And uh, Buke's aim was, uh, uh, and I quote, to find a means of developing a wider and more connected view of our world and a truly cosmic view of the universe and our place in it. So both the book and the film uh, show a series of images which through a progression of scales uh, show different elements and zooming out from a one-to-one -one scale of a human, each subsequent larger or smaller scale uh, puts the previous one into perspective. Showing a wider image uh, allows one to visualize where the smaller element is placed and which other elements it is surrounded by. To conclude, uh, slowly breaking down uh, these utopian works down to their building blocks uh, has allowed me uh, to identify the similarities and differences uh, which occur through different scales and in different intensities. Uh, performing the analysis on each scale separately has also enabled me to understand how the different elements correlate throughout the scales and how they work or don't work together and how they form intricate spatial and social systems. So, and while I have talked about uh, today some of the literary origins which influenced the development of my approach, uh, the basis of it was always innately architectural. Uh, what starts as a traditional, a formal and typological analysis uh, of the different forms and spaces proposed in utopian architectural projects, it developed to also include what we would today call a post-occupancy study. Uh, in other words, how the buildings and spaces which were produced had an effect on its inhabitants and vice versa. So what starts as a visual analysis through different scales of space uh, develops into an analysis of, uh, and definition uh, of various scales through which humans and other beings operate uh, within a society. Uh, through identifying similar tools across the two disciplines, uh, which operate in a like manner, uh, what initially seemed as a problematic task uh, of comparing the textual world of literature uh, with the visual and speculative world of architecture uh, becomes an exciting task of filling out the misses, missing pieces of the puzzles. And understanding that literature also produces images, uh, albeit in a less directly visual form, uh, allows us uh, to use the established tools of the architectural research uh, in order to cross uh, disciplinary boundaries and produce new approaches and uh, hopefully also new kinds of knowledge. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Jana. Uh, is, am I saying your name correctly? Is it Jana? Yes, Jana. It's, yeah. Jana, yeah. That was great. Um, uh, we'll move immediately on to Enrico Miglietta now uh, with his paper, Moving from the Fragment. Um, and um, yeah, and we'll move forward so we can have our discussion at the end. So Enrico, can you um, share your screen, please? Yes. Thank you. OK, should see it. Um, we've had a request for slow speaking, uh, <laughs> and I know this is the timing that is uh, I know quite the can speak very tight. fast. So I'm just <laughs> just before you start. <laughs> just a moment, try to. Okay, so good morning to you all. And uh, as introduced, my intervention will be about the proposal of a methodology for reading architecture. Um, that I'm developing uh, as a PhD thesis. And uh, as you may know, the notion of uh, fragment in architecture was uh, and is uh, one of the most problematic crossroads. And uh, we can find uh, traces of its investigation since uh, the Hellenistic times uh, in the spoliation and reuse of uh, ancient materials, then in the medieval Renaissance uh, and so on. However, uh, we can see that it is uh, actually defined uh, within modern aesthetics <clears throat> with the famous uh, enquiry 
published by Burke, uh, in which it is uh, realized in the conception of the indeterminate, the picturesque disorder, and of the ruin. It is uh, precisely from the sphere of contents of the latter that uh, at different times uh, some authors can derive what we can define uh, as uh, the two fundamental instances uh, activated by the fragment or uh, the relationship uh, between the part and the whole and therefore that between the whole and the complete. In the wake uh, of uh, what uh, work traces, uh, it was uh, up uh, perhaps to John Swan to reintroduce the fragment into the modern as an element of crisis in the classical language of architecture. As that, it is no coincidence that it becomes a starting point for an interrogative exception to that established tradition of the modern that was being classified also as a new way of being of classicism in favor of more empirical researches. And uh, as lesson of balance, for me, the works uh, of architects such as Scarpa, Lever, and uh, Asplund, Kionis, Riva, and uh, many others, seems to really move from the fragment, from uh, a work on the detail where uh, every singularity participates uh, in the organization of architecture. And uh, their work for me was also the starting point for a research on, on uh, how we can intend the work on, uh, of uh, fragmentation from uh, modern times until uh, our days. And uh, in fact, what is uh, interesting, it is uh, that they also seem to indicate a third possible uh, way of the fragment uh, or uh, a movement that goes from uh, the, par the particular to the particular in a way that it's uh, not uh, of deductive and inductive logic, uh, but uh, of analogy. And uh, we will deepen this thought in a few slides. So what do we mean when we talk about the fragment? Uh, we can observe it as a fractal with a potentially infinite grow and decrease, but uh, instead uh, we propose to limit the extent to what is uh, directly observable and uh, we can touch by hand at the scale of architecture and detail, therefore to the minimum units of construction of meaning. Uh, we can describe it as a form element uh, or as a paradoxical structure which uh, somehow contains uh, the form in itself being defined. And uh, as that, uh, we can hypothesize that this paradigmatic relationship uh, does not only develop between individual objects, uh, nor between these uh, and an a priori rule, but also between a singularity and uh, its uh, intelligibility. Uh, obviously, not all the fragments containing themselves uh, such uh, expressive value as to justify a thorough analysis, uh, but uh, we can simply perceive how some appears as a structure uh, where technique, uh, mathematics, and symbolic values combine in perfect harmony. And uh, if it is possible to make this observation in a vague way, uh, the research intends to try and provide a generalized demonstration. So on the wake of the operational criticism uh, traced by Tafuri, the tradition of Italian studies uh, has attempted on several occasions to define the promises, but also the dangers of uh, ideologism of such a practice. The same was then uh, rehabilitated uh, by Renato De Fusco on the threshold of uh, the possibilities offered by that uh, critique passionné uh, theorized by Baudelaire. Uh, this is a partial and passionate research conducted from a specific uh, point of view, but at the same tape, time uh, capable of opening up a uh, vast horizon. And uh, in fact, the theories contained in, it, in the two books uh, paved the road from, uh, for the Italian tradition of analytical and semiotic uh, reasoning in architecture, which, however, in which, however, a complementary process of a more pragmatic nature seems to be lacking or being used uh, in a non-systematic way. And uh, in this other direction, several studies on the operational design-driven research are trying in recent years to clarify the relationship between the use of design tools and the validation of critical and operative position. And uh, as for that, the embedded process of drawing seems to force uh, to question the structure of appearances putting ourselves in a direct comparison with the vagueness uh, that we were talking about before. 
In fact, uh, uh, even the simple operation of measurement and annotation of redesign in a space can be a process of transmission and above all productive. So this investigation, uh, of course, does not intend to minimize or deny the results obtained by methods based on logical argumentation, but to demonstrate how through the hybridization of the true reasoning process, uh, it is possible in some cases to reach similar conclusion and possibly extracting knowledge from uh, what has been analyzed. Uh, we can take so a, a cue from the artistic practice uh, where in different moments the investigation of uh, Cezanne paintings has uh, led to the discovery of a poetics that uh, privileges uh, not so much the space between things, uh, but uh, their binder or uh, as an ambit that, seem that, that seems to condense uh, an instance of searching for truth. It is also in the joint uh, that uh, Kenneth Frampton in uh, his depth study dedicated to Scarpa uh, also glimpses uh, a principle of tectonic condensation and uh, in his uh, adoration, a logic of uh, clarification of the composition. Uh, as uh, of that, we can describe uh, tectonics uh, as uh, something that comes uh, before architecture, containing uh, this uh, primary unit, uh, called at a preformative, precultural, and uh, superhistorical stage. Uh, it is precisely in the joints uh, as uh, focal points or densification of meanings uh, that we propose to move the investigation. Uh, to delve into the method, we can investigate two well-known uh, architecture designed and built a few years apart, the Church of St. Peter's in Clippan uh, by Sigurd Leverenz and the uh, Carlo Scarpa uh, Brion Cemetery in uh, San Vito dal Tivole, uh, both widely recognized uh, as uh, masterpieces, uh, of course, and uh, paradigmatic examples of two different ways of operating. In fact, uh, if for the second, the uh, construction form uh, correspondence allow us to query and re read its functioning, in the Church of Clippan, we can almost read a negation of the constructive process, uh, or as it was defined, uh, an architecture as a paradox of uh, construction. From this point of view, by breaking down the analyzed fragment into different parts, uh, it is possible to consider the agency of the joint uh, as a pre-signature, which uh, outside a consolidated history expresses the event of a sign without uh, a meaning and found within it uh, an identity initially devoid of content. And uh, at this point, it will be possible to inquire the drawings through a series of artifices in order to operate a reduction from the multiple to the unitary. And uh, in this regard, they are specifically measure, uh, proportion and collocation. For uh, both works, uh, it is possible to start uh, the investigation by extracting a particular fragment uh, where the greatest chances of finding useful elements uh, for the analysis seem to be condensed. And uh, the determination of the fragments to be investigated will be followed by its uh, full-scale redesign, which measures and observes the reality of the construction, noting where necessary were the first observation. And uh, an operation of this kind, uh, then extending to the overall survey of the work, uh, will constitute the starting data and the cognitive representation of the existing, uh, and uh, at the same time, a rewriting of the project that can, be, can, that can partisanally uh, produce new text, therefore interpretation in the form of insights to be verified. What we can find from such an investigation, uh, for example, is that the number, the measure, the 5.5 .5, uh, module in Scarpa or the brick module in uh, Leverenz uh, seems to accompany the work of the two architects uh, as a form of pre-understanding of the material and uh, of its possible form that is rooted in the author experience. In both works, uh, we can find uh, two different sets of measure that build uh, up a system of relation, allowing as uh, that uh, the jointing of different materials uh, and also hinting at different meanings embedded in the fragment. This phase, of course, has to pass through a layer of verification of uh, the hypothesis that will look up to the original drawings to find uh, confirmation of the supposition. Uh, if uh, we observe as fragment the complex of the pavilion and uh, the nave from uh, which we extracted earlier, in both cases we can uh, easily build uh, a system of relation entirely internal to the work 
uh, which make use of, of the classical instrument of proportioning and composition of the different parts uh, from the use uh, of the golden ratio up to in particular in the case of Scarpa to the Fibonacci series uh, and daring mathematical calculation if we look uh, in depth. Expanding the field of observation of the drawing, so we can observe how the principle uh, described before inform not only the definition on, of uh, individual parts, but uh, with an extroverted movement, uh, also the construction of a system of analogical references that proceeds not so much uh, towards the definition of a whole, but uh, in a direction that seems to foresee an elaborate use of uh, geometry as uh, an element of remeasurement. Just uh, as an example, through drawing, we can read uh, how the vaulted roof of uh, San Petri was uh, geometrically built in a way that allowed uh, the construction to be easier using one single measure of reference and, and not as many one well, uh, can initially prototype. However, it would be too simple to entrust the success of the structures to mere mathematical resolution or compositional clarity. Uh, in fact, the refined use of mounting techniques uh, informs uh, the geometries of the vicinity as the development of uh, the corresponding relation of uh, plants and elevation, the development of paths, uh, the definition of visual alignments, and the poetics of uh, light and shadow. Uh, for instance, we can simply demonstrate how the geometries of the Brion Cemetery slowly lead the visitor from the main entrance the pavilion and the meditation pool in an extraordinary assemblage of uh, fragments and archaic forms, or uh, how in clip and the game of encounters built opening wall fissures, uh, niches, etc. Uh, in fact, the joint, the construction technique, uh, appears as a latent of alternative solution that can be interrogated multiple times. And uh, the constructive experiences of the two architects uh, allow them to investigate the same principle in uh, several times, uh, in the same fragment, uh, in the same work, uh, as in architecture and project distant uh, in space and time, adapting the procedural needs uh, from time to time to the nature of the places uh, and specific needs. Without, of course, going into the depths uh, of uh, semiological analysis, uh, we can uh, briefly observe uh, returning to the initial fragments, uh, how some elements uh, found at the scale of detail can inform the whole work. And uh, thanks to the similar intended use, uh, the themes of the double of the distancing of uh, primitivism uh, are present in both works, uh, but giving rise to different views. In the Church of Clippan, for example, the couple column and uh, its asymmetrical location recall the sign of uh, redemption as uh, this uh, T-shaped cross, cross uh, symbolification of the uh, crux uh, commits, uh, connects the ground and the sky. Uh, for Scarpa, just observing the small icon of the Vesica species, we can re-extract the observed module of 11 centimeters in a close relationship with the intrinsic duality of the Vesica. And uh, as for Leverance, the allusion to the double, the earthly and the spiritual means that the structural element is uh, not only symbolically transfigured, but also made as gesture, uh, is uh, in fact sustaining and supporting the community of faith. Uh, here, the hardness of the encounter with the ground uh, contrasts with the thinness of the structural elements that connects the structure with uh, the roof walls. Uh, which disappears in the shadow of uh, which the nave is permeated, leaving paradoxically the feeling that the roof is uh, raised from everything else. Uh, as for Carpa, uh, almost all uh, the references to the tomb are uh, played uh, on this duality, as if uh, to bring back to the earth, to the human, uh, the mysticism offered by the symbolic and the iconic proliferation. And uh, this leads to a congruence of measures uh, where every dimension is uh, calculated based uh, on this ambiguity and leads the architects to set the point of observation on, uh, of the architecture at a specific point. For uh, both works, uh, we can see in the joint a uh, sort of primary particle of uh, architecture and its construction process. And uh, extending this reasoning uh, for the uh, composite structure, we can define it as a first constructive act, 
from uh, carefully putting two bricks together to connecting a beam and a pillar. And uh, assuming from the notion that nothing is uh, created, uh, the joint, uh, more than uh, with a generic notion of origin of form, uh, seems to have something to do with the, that of uh, the point of onset uh, in the, the ground of techniques, uh, in which the architect uh, experiences history by deconstructing its uh, paradigms. In this sense, uh, it is a form of pre-signature or the expression of a sign imprinted by the author and uh, in which proximity are condensed reading and writing clues uh, that can resurface uh, from, the from the deconstruction of the paradigm fragment or elements of attribution that uh, can allow us to decipher our work. We can move from this observation by proposing the architect's signature is uh, giving shape uh, as an act of understanding of the existing uh, that is rooted in the idea of community and derived from a system of measurement inextricably linked to a material existence. So to conclude, what makes uh, then a fragment move? Uh, for me, it's an expression of meaning in which uh, pragmatism, mathematics and semiosis uh, concur and makes themselves uh, synthetically understandable, uh, defining what we can call, uh, borrowing the definition from uh, Giovanni Maddalena, as a complete gesture. In fact, uh, structures uh, tendering, sustaining, and uh, distancing themselves uh, metonymically embody a human action that comes through through the author political involvement in the body of architecture. And uh, the analysis of this intention to define them as uh, perceivable wants to demonstrate a path that from their vague state, uh, a fertile ground for, in, for intuition, can uh, demonstrate a, a generalizability. Uh, so describing the link from figure to action as a line of identity. And as that, we can speculate that uh, design doesn't put the man in the center, but it is uh, somehow rewriting and uh, reinterpreting. This hypothesis can uh, generate uh, multiple openings in my view. Uh, first of all, uh, for the proposal of a transnational vision on the theme of the fragment, that uh, through a comparative study can also bring out uh, lesser known figures uh, of the architectural panorama, focusing so the attention of, on that design attitude that sees uh, in uh, proceeding by fragments and in the pragmatic work on the full-scale drawing uh, and historiography in continuous evolution. And uh, with these premises, uh, the study can be also freed from any timely, stylistic or uh, linguistic conditioning, allowing us to focus more on the components than on the images of architecture. And uh, at the same time, the instruments of uh, the investigation can become a pedagogical tool which leans in a theoretical and practical form on a series of previous experiences, but uh, at the same time uh, renewing uh, their tools and uh, research objectives and uh, describing through their interrogative sequence uh, the essential points of a tacit knowledge that is inscribed in architectural practices. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Enrico. You just made it in your time slot. <laughs> well yes, done. <laughs> <laughs> and you spoke quite slowly, which is great because uh, follow that. Excellent. So now um, I just in the last speaker is Sarah Mendes, and um, I'm asking you now, Sarah, to share your screen and uh, tell us about the building is how the building is present. Mm. Can you see my screen and hear me properly? 100% there, so. Okay. Um, so in this presentation, um, I will discuss the physical one to five model as a tool for research, design and communication. And um, this presentation is based upon a research um, and design project undertaken in the spring of 2019 by 13 international master students at the TU Delft. It was led by architect Thomas Dirks and myself and initiated in response to a current debate in Rotterdam surrounding the transformation of Museum Boymans van Beunen. The subject of this presentation is the one to five model as a tool 
But to illustrate our considerations, I will first brief briefly describe the case study in which it was tested. Uh, museum Boymans van Beuningen is an art museum in Rotterdam, and its building is an ensemble of different building parts from different times. Um, the 1935 original mu uh, museum uh, is characterized by cabinets reflecting the domestic setting most of the original paintings originated from, uh, designed by architect Ad van der Steur. And over time, the museum has expanded three times. In 1972, with a large scale and flexible museum shed by Alexander Baudon. In 1991, with a glass and steel pavilion in the garden by Hubert Jan Henket. And most recently, in 2003, with an extension by Robert and Dam that embraces the Baudon extension and recalibrated the museum for the 21st century. As such, the ensemble itself can be seen as a collection that represents changing insights into museum building and the way we view art over time. In 2018, the museum announced that as part of a renovation, it wishes to demolish its latest two extensions in favor of a new wing. Um, that they recently announced uh, will be designed by Meccano, an architect. And to us, both as architects and as regular visitors, these extensions never struck us as particularly dysfunctional. So, in opposition to the uh, unsustainable tabula rasa approach of the museum, we formulated a research and design project in which we aim to address the shortcomings of the current museum by departing from what is already there. So, for both the research and design phase of the project, we decided to work with one to five models. And in doing so, our ambition was threefold. Firstly, we wanted to explore the model as an analytical tool. And within the project, we wanted to focus the attention on the experience of the museum as a physical and intimate encounter with the building. We considered different scales for this exercise, and each of these scales would entail a slightly different way of looking. A 1 to 10 scale model would allow for the construction of smaller rooms in their entirety. Scale 1 to 1 would direct the attention to the technical detail. Scale 1 to 5, we suspected, would focus the attention on the material meeting of surfaces and was therefore best suited to represent the tactile experience of the museum. Secondly, we wanted to explore the model as a didactic tool. Having to build a one to five model means students will have to consider its material, its construction, its detailing. And in the context of a project that criticizes the logic of demolition and new construction as unsustainable, it was important, we thought, to make students aware of the resistance of materials, even at a reduced scale, and the effort and resources involved in building something. We expected this scale to have consequences for the nature of the interventions they would design, small in scale and focusing on tactile qualities. Thirdly, we saw this project as an exercise in architectural engagement, in which we criticized the way the museum organized, organization approached its building. In creating beautiful, exhibitable objects, we hope to elevate the architectural qualities these objects would uncover and for them to be an active agent in the discussion surrounding the transformation of the museum. So I will explain our findings uh, following these three categories. Um, firstly, the model as an analytical tool. We found that the one to five scale poses restriction to the size fragment that can be extracted from the building and therefore in large part determines what becomes significant. As we suspected at the outset of the project, larger than a technical detail, but smaller than a space. The fragments are therefore neither detail nor space, but rather experiential and material moments within the building. The, consequences, the consequence of analyzing the museum by constructing one to five models of moments within the building meant that we came to locate the essence of the building at the scale of the fragment. In doing so, this way of working proposes the identification of the significant architectural moment as a way of analyzing what is valuable in a building. Using the one to five model therefore implies a specific way of looking, one that locates valuable architectural themes within the material fragment. For example, this fragment of the facade of the extension by Robrecht and Dam, which explored the light layered relationship between inside and outside, or this model, 
which isolated the thickened wall in between two galleries in the original museum and focused the attention on the idea of the museum as a series of thresholds. The one to five scale posed an interesting challenge as we found that it is at this scale mostly possible to exactly replicate the existing. Abstraction is no longer a necessary consequence of the format, but becomes a deliberate choice. The most interesting models hovered between exact representation and intentional abstraction. For example, this model, which represents the meeting of two building parts from 1935 and 2003, and the builders of this model identified the confrontation of different building parts from different times and the way that these moments are negotiated within architecture as a core characteristic of the museum. Van der Stur's 1935 brick wall is reconstructed using cut and colored MDF bricks assembled in its characteristic bond. Robert and Dam's extension is abstracted to the rough concrete of the construction and poured using actual concrete. The window frames inserted next to Van der Stur's wall are left out, abstracting the moment to the meeting of the two materials. This model was both a highly ac accurate and vibrant representation of the fragment and at the same time an abstraction, focusing on a specific way that the architects of the extension expressed the meeting between new and old. And secondly, the model as a didactic tool. On the basis of the themes we identified when building the one to five fragments of the museum, the students went on to develop interventions into the museum. And then they built these interventions or fragments of these interventions again at scale one to five, the results of which you see at the, in this slide. And as we suspected, the outcome of this was a series of small scale interventions within the museum. But even though they are small in scale, each had an impact beyond their physical limits and managed to address a larger concern of the museum. Working on the one to five scale was instrumental in retaining the focus on this small scale and made it possible for us to, um, made it possible for us to discuss the tactile and material qualities of the developing designs within the studio setting. In doing so, it enforced a kind of concreteness and precision into the analysis and design. During the analysis, we found that there were, broadly speaking, two approaches to the way the models were built. Imitating the appearance of the fragments versus getting as close as possible to the actual material, materiality of the fragments. And from our study, it appears that this difference also has consequences for the nature of the interventions that were developed. To illustrate this point, I will explain two of the projects in more detail. Uh, some students choose to represent the materiality of their fragments by using other materials, mostly foam, that was painted or covered with other materials, such as this one that you see here, um, which is a model of a round marble staircase, which is part of the original entrance sequence of the museum. And these students constructed the model out of foam and represent the marble sections by covering them with textures printed on paper. Rather than imitating the building process as well as possible, they focused on creating a convincing appearance, appearance irrespective of the presumed truthfulness of the deployed materials. Following the building of the model, they expanded their research into an analysis of the staircases and circulation of the museum as a whole, addressing the wish of the museum to improve the possibilities for circulation and to increase its capacity to receive visitors. Their proposal is to add a new staircase to this collection, and its exact position means it is accessible from the entrance area of the museum, relieving what is currently the main staircase, and enabling new routes through the building. As the focus in building the one to five fragment was on representing the surface textures, this is reflected in their mater materiality of their design. It has a similar material palette, concrete and marble, and was built using the same technique. While developing their intervention, they zoomed out to a larger scale, and only when building the one to five model, they again started to work and think on a smaller scale. Therefore, as a strategic proposal, the staircase was highly convincing, but the final design and one to five model of their intervention remained relatively abstract. 
the builders of the second subset of models try to come as close as possible to the materiality of the actual fragments, such as this one. And for their intervention, these groups continued in the same vein as they built their fragment, thinking and designing on a one to five scale. They kept their vision small scale, focused on specific problematic areas within the building and developed their intervention very much from the process of constructing it. In the case of this group, uh, in parallel to building this one to five fragment, they expanded their research into the theme of the architectural joints. They focused their intervention on another more complicated and currently less successful joint that you can see on the, in the drawing on the left, a small patio next to a narrow landing which received most of the visitors of the museum between Van der Sturr's old structure and the new gallery space by Robert and Dame. The intervention that you see on the right proposes to eliminate this blind patio in favor of extending the landing, making it a more generous space and creating a welcome experience of entry into the galleries of the first floor. The proposed structure, crafted out of timber, was developed at scale one to five to embody the same principle of respectful distance to the previous work, while still showcasing itself as a new chapter in the Bohemond's history. They also repeat the move of visually distancing the new from the older as a clearly legible addition by detailing this extended threshold as a piece of wooden furniture within the gallery space. Beyond demonstrating the value of these small scale interventions, the relevant relevance of the most successful projects lies in how they show how one can develop a contextual and precise approach to adjust the existing. In this case, from a close reading, of the way that especially Robert and Dame approached the meeting of new and old, these students developed a highly specific approach when adjusting and adding to the existing ensemble. The one to five scale makes it possible to develop this approach in a concentrated way without having to immediately address the complexities of the entire building. Just as the one to five fragment of the existing can tease out a critical moment and stands for a specific interpretation of the building, at best, each intervention is a highly suggestive example of a specific approach expand, that might be expanded to address the transformation of the building as a whole. And then finally, I get to the model as a tool of communication. Um, because in setting the terms of the project, we suspect that there might be value in creating a collection of beautiful material pieces to represent the museum. And after the educational project had finished, we were able to present the outcome to a larger audience in December of 2019. And at this exhibition and debate on the architecture of the museum and its future, the physicality and recognizability of the large scale models as fragments of the museum clearly communicate, communicated the qualities of the building. The joy and love that evidently went into making them were a convincing case for the existing architecture but also during the design process itself, when the fragments were at all times present within the studio, these models worked as highly concrete reminders of the experience of the building. The building never became an abstract notion, but remained a character in the room. So to conclude, in this presentation, I've described the potential of the one to five model as a tool for the architect to analyze the architectural qualities of a building, how this can serve as a basis for architectural transformations and the value of the large scale model in communicating the, resu the results of such research to a wider audience. In doing so, the large scale, large scale model as a tool has the potential to traverse the realms of research, teaching and practice. And fi finally, these are the names of the students that worked on this project. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, um, Sarah. That, that was very interesting and I think a great um, lead into the question that I wanted to start with. Um, shall we, um, what should we do, um, Irene? Um, do we yes, we, we're getting the both other speakers to the fore. We were, we're they become pin-ups now. <laughs> the pin-ups. <laughs> I think, yeah, because you're yeah. pinning them. Yes, Absolutely. great. There I you are. You did a great job at keeping to time. Um, and we've got 25 minutes for a conversation now, which I think would be very, very interesting. And I think I think what your, your three talks made very clear is what the tools are of the, of the researcher, the, 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 the tools that we've been discussing 
uh, through the whole symposium of drawing and model making, Sarah's brought model making into the into the um, field. But I think what I'm quite interested in is what are the techniques now that the three of you have um, discussed in how to make use of those tools. And you know, I see in each of your papers that the techniques are the interfaces with the tools, where the questions are raised and the discoveries are made. So. I mean, there are, I've got you know various like you know but you, various techniques come to, to into play. But I think scale, for example, for me is one that's very interesting in each one of yours, uh, your your talks in different ways. And I, I think Enrico, maybe it's the least explicit. But I think when you're talking about proportion, that is also an idea, an embedded technique in relation to the analytical tools that you're using. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to this idea of scale and how what you discovered by um, moving between scales in, in your investigations. Would you like to start, Joanna? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Helen, and thank you both, uh, Sarah and uh, Enrico. I think it was a super interesting, uh, both super interesting lectures. And I found it uh, uh, very curious how basically all three of us are not uh, dealing with uh, either the architecture as a whole, or in my case, the, the kind of project as a whole, but rather looking at the fragments. And this is, I think, relates a lot also to, to your question of scale. So. Uh, for me, the, the scale uh, was in a way uh, um, an organizing technique in the first case, kind of a, a way to um, to assemble the different fragments uh, that I was looking at, to put them uh, into kind of correlation and interrelation. But uh, then it also, after it was a way of uh, setting them apart, it was also a way of seeing how they interrelate and how they how they are brought back together and uh, as a basically a very architectural uh, kind of innate architectural I wouldn't even say tool I don't know almost but a way of working uh, I think uh, it's something that it's not uh, really discussed or theorized much the the kind of uh, standards of scale and how a scale is approaching what do you actually uh, uh, how to use scale to see different things and what comes uh, to focus within a different scale. So I found it super interesting to start looking into this uh, topic a little bit uh, through the research itself and found it uh, very useful for, for organizing both the work and, and thoughts and the drawings and uh, the, the ideas uh, that come up, not only in what scale they're represented, but also the scale on which they operate, which is not always the same scale, of course. Um, I mean, I, I noticed that, you know, in your drawing, uh, the kind of your um, powers of ten light drawing that you had a whale and cars as, as ways of understanding the scale of the, of the, of the mother or the woman. Uh, and I thought that was quite interesting. Um, and it, um, I, I get, it doesn't exactly lead on to what I want to say, but I thought, you know, I mean, it did, it did make me wonder, you know, what's, you know, if you think in one scale, if you transfer that way of thinking into a different scale, you know, what does that produce? And in a way that connects to what Sarah was talking about, I think with, I mean, I, I you know it, it brought up real questions of material authenticity, um, uh, me, when, when you were showing your models about how you made decisions about that. And then it, it also reminded me of um, yesterday when, um, when Wilfred was talking about reproducing the bedroom of, of the Eileen Gray house and the screen and, you know those issues of authenticity that um, that came out. So, you know, how does how do changes in scales um, affect this idea of authenticity? Do you think? Um, I, when we when we set this project, we were very much or the the notions of intimacy and empathy were very much on our mind, and um, and we wanted to to find a way to, to foster a kind of empathy or, or to be able to discuss the sort of intimate encounter with the building. And, and the sort of finding the right scale for that was quite uh, crucial, I think. And then we sort of the one to five scale was in a way also sort of an intuitive decision. And then, then as we were doing it, we will also be able to rationalize it as, as I also did in this uh, presentation. And we found that um, that it is indeed a good scale to um, 
to be able to talk about kind of the, the material encounter and also if you walk if you walk to a museum in, in our case sort of these material moments are the are what you remember from the building somehow but then again it also it also excludes certain experiential things such as the way that lights fall into a space or a view through a series of galleries and so um so this um yeah this this method has and and tells a specific way of looking but also excludes certain things um and and in the case and i think that could also be part of of further research um uh, because for example the yeah yeah but what we're going to say for example uh, it's, uh, you use you can't you use the same materials didn't you, you used you said you poured concrete and but um I mean, like the idea of uh, the idea of material authenticity depends more than just the actual material itself, doesn't it? In a way, it's what you were what, what you were talking about about how the light falls differently and how I mean, it's a spatial experience as well. I think mm. I mean, and this and this now links to it, in a way what I think Enrique was talking about when he's talking about the fragment that you're very much making fragments, and I think you know. It, it raises very interesting question i think your your paper about this issue of um authenticity in relation to a whole or a fragment and i think yana's as well um with her breaking down of different scales so she has the you have the room don't you yana and then the the building and the you know what is the relationship between these di these different scales and different concepts of fragment and maybe enrique wants to to move on to that, yes, something, uh, that's something you, that you're really thinking. I, about. I really very much connected with the um, uh, lecture that Professor Wang uh, gave the last night about the authentic. Because also for me that the, the full scale drawing, the one to one uh, redesign, uh, it's uh, a way of starting the investigation uh, uh, exactly from the built work, from the final form. Uh, of the work uh, and then uh, tracing uh, it uh, back uh, also to the, the retracing the first step that led to this uh, authentic uh, object in a way the most authentic we can uh, we can find in a way and um, I also uh, like very much the intervention by Isere and uh, I um, I was reading also on uh, the journal Oese the uh, the issue of uh, the the model that is uh, in a way always full scale in uh, well, the the practice of uh, uh, Caruso and John in photographing these models uh, that uh, also in, if uh, they are in uh, one to five one to twenty scale in a photograph uh, always uh, uh, becomes uh, in a certain sense uh, full scale. Uh, representing the space, uh, how it works with, of course, their uh, limitations. So it's a very interesting point of uh, point of questioning in a way of architecture, in my opinion. And and then Jana is um, Sarah is very much dealing with an all, you know with, with actual materials, and I think Jana is is dealing with um, imaginary materials in a way, which I find quite you know the, the written and the, the novelistic. The fictional, which um, is something I feel very sympathetic to, and I'm wondering, you know, how do you relate to that, Jana? This idea of, of, of potential authenticity within the fragment. Yeah, it's uh, since yeah, the the reconstruction, basically, from of the the literary part, is of course involves a lot of speculation in it from from an architectural perspective. But I think what what uh, with the fragments, what I found interesting, and then again with the relation with the scale, is that you I approached. Um, the city, so from an architectural perspective, the, the kind of social scale is missing and the scale of the individual. So you start investigating the city through the scale of a person to the scale of the, the inhabitant. And in the literary part, it's the opposite. You uh, investigate, uh, you are trying to depict the city from the experience of the individual. So it's this uh, kind of a part to whole uh, relationship which is flipped on its head depending on, on the field in which you're looking at. And then it's a question of that the fragment is something which is embedded uh, deep in the, in the very large picture in the architectural uh, 
uh, case and also the, the fragment which builds uh, the whole in the in the literary part. So this is what I, yeah, with the, the scales, what I found very interesting, but it's also, of course, uh, since it's fiction and since it's speculative and since it's rebuilding, it cannot uh, ever be completely exact and completely precise. But I think uh, this is also where uh, it becomes interesting to kind of try and note and discover all the, the different possibilities that it could be. And this is why it's, it's uh, multiple projects and multiple, um, multiple ideas that are investigated to kind of try and assemble the bigger picture in a way. Um, Helen, can I ask yeah, a, a question yeah. to to all three of the of the researchers? I, I I really find this very very interesting, the way you approach these the practice of architectural research because it seems to me that, of course, I mean many things have been researched already, and you're trying to find new angles, and uh, new perspectives, and you all seem to work within the reality of well maybe yesterday's lecture like within the mess you try to order it from not so much from trying to get the the, the big picture but really take more or less the, the the back entrance more um i was just wondering um how do you come from the back entrance how do you get out in the front so so if you if you start with this you know with the materiality or with uh, the, the speculation of utopia um these these quite unusual entrances do you feel it's necessary then to link to more conventional ways or how do you do the dialogue with then other forms of research if it's so particular or is that not a problem at all can you um yeah i can respond to that first maybe um because we um we really did thematize that in the project as well to sort of try to sort of from from the fragments get back to the whole and in our case to address sort of concerns of the museum or how they wanted to transform it and then um but sort of this this sort of this fragment we use it as a kind of pars pro toto and then and then students were able from this fragment to distill certain in, a specific architectural theme that came to sort of stand for the museum or that was the way that they interpreted the museum such as the idea of the museum as a series of thresholds or how how the meeting of old and new is staged within the museum and so in each case sort of the model was a way of interpreting the museum and with that interpretation you can then expand your view again to the museum as a whole and we also asked them to do that and then to find within the museum an issue that they wanted to address. Um, and then uh, and then from there also to then zoom in again to kind of an, a, a very physical intervention. But it, um, but it but it does hold the position as well. Eh? It's, it's a sort of the appreciation of material reality, the, 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 the and, and the idea of empathy. It is very much because you you even use it as a political tool, which I mm. understood was a heroic gesture, but uh, it didn't really change <laughs> the course of the development of the museum. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet can come. But Enrico, I think you also, you, you, you um, study buildings, which, I mean, we've seen quite, I mean, Leverenz is the, 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 the hit of, the, of this symposium. Apparently everybody studies it unfortunately I'm also <laughs> um, but so you need if you if you study this canon you need a different angle and what so what does the fragment give you to study these canonical buildings is, oh. it, is it a way of attacking conventional research or just to finding your niche or yes uh, in fact what does it imply uh, well, the the choice of uh, the starting uh, case study was um, also done because uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, reference studies uh, and uh, investigations on uh, on that. There are uh, large archives of uh, drawings, so I can verify in a way what I am uh, proposing on uh, architecture that are quite uh, are masterpieces. So yes. they are uh, they are well documented. 
And uh, in a way, the idea is then to extend this uh, kind of reasoning also to uh, non-famous uh, architecture as uh, to find uh, how uh, this uh, design principle in a way uh, has built also a genealogy in uh, our uh, present days. And uh, in a way, the, the idea of investigating the, the fragments uh, in this architecture also implies uh, in a way the non-necessity of finding a hole in this uh, architecture for example we can see the, the work of scarpa uh, to me it always seems a little bit unfinished in a way as uh, you probably he could have added uh, something uh, or uh, so it's uh, it's um, important to talk about completeness in this uh, in this architects project uh, it's uh, one of the questions and so so the tool of of, of taking the fragment is in in, in also um, um, a way to to point out at certain aspects of the work so the tool and when you want to sort of demonstrate are carefully selected the way for example also paolo uses tracings himself because he finds traces in the work of so it's a double of method and 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 uh, and, and point of study and, and maybe even jana in your project the same happens eh? because you use the same tools these speculative drawings are of course what what a lot of utopias um, were used to uh, to um to to uh, to visualize the utopians, you, do you make utopian drawings as well? Is there also a sort of doubling? Yes, well, in a way, there is a doubling uh, to yeah to uh, summarize uh, some of the the knowledge. But then again, the drawings that uh, are in a way doubled uh, contain then a lot of different layers of information that perhaps the original ones don't, and they're more of a kind of uh, a uh, combination of different types of information gathered uh, gathered from uh, from the existing architectural projects but maybe to also kind of reflect on this uh, um, this question of uh, looking at the fragments instead of looking at the whole and how it relates to to other uh, types of research uh, in my case it was uh, almost a way to kind of um, uh, on the one hand, to scale down uh, the breadth of the of the research, so in in an order in a kind of intention not to do a, a vast historical overview of the utopian works of the last hundred years, and to kind of justify this by looking only on the uh, at the ideas themselves that come up both in the the works and in the context. It given that these ideas uh, keep coming back not only uh, in the, the original works that they were kind of developed, but also in, in works afterwards. So also Super Studios uh, um, projects are not, uh, on the one hand, they are innovative, but they also are built on, on a tradition which came before them. And then a lot of contemporary projects such as this build again on these ideas. So it was also a way to kind of um, look at it from a different angle to, to justify uh, bringing the context and the fiction together uh, on, the same, on the same level in a way. In, when you look at the whole picture and uh, you look at the works uh, as a whole, it's uh, much more difficult to justify that and to, to take these, uh, all these ideas uh, and treat them in the same way, I would say. Um, I, I could... Oh, no, 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 I could go on forever, so please <laughs> take no, back because I, I think... Not, I've got one last question because we've got a few minutes left. Um, but, I mean, because I, mean, I, I find this idea of tools and techniques that you and uh, Carolyn set up very fascinating. And, um, and I just, you know, I think the, I, there is something else that um, enables the tools to be used. And for me, the use of theoretical thinking, which hasn't really come up yet, um, and I think that uh, Jana and Enrico both explicitly use it, and I think with Sarah, it's more the context of the work that you're doing, the, the pedagogical context, and also the political one in relation to the to the museum. So, in a sense, um, I think Jana and Enrico are, are making a context using theor theoretical 
thinking and I'm just wondered if you could speak to that just a little bit the idea of theory or context as a technique of, a, of using the tool <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, I I very I, I like uh, that you bring this up. I haven't uh, thought about it uh, in that context myself, but I would say that definitely is uh, using uh, so not uh, perhaps uh, history as a tool, but theory as a tool. Uh, so instead of uh, tracing uh, things in a linear way, it's possible to trace them in a more uh, yeah, non-linear way to pick up the theoretical concepts and the ideas and to try and construct a picture through that, which perhaps then gives a different viewpoint. And then it's based on theoretical concepts and not on um, historical events, let's say, or, or historical linearity. But uh, it's a very interesting way of looking at it. I have to think about this a bit more <laughs> that you mentioned. It. Yeah. It's also for me, the theoretical aspect of the thesis are in a way the, the ground on which to found the, the, the method in a way there are a, a succession of experience uh, academic and non-academical uh, held in the, in the past which uh, in a way builds up the, the grounds for uh, um, a, a renewed uh, research uh, if you want and uh, you know, it was um, also do the, the yes the, the tradition of uh, Italian studies is always uh, also the the, the the university I'm in the Politecnico di Milano is uh, uh, always very um, uh, I don't know uh, we feel. Uh, um, in a way, obliged to uh, ground our speculation on uh, uh, something that has been uh, studied uh, as uh, also as a traditional studies in, in a way, and uh, it of course uh, uh, gives us uh, uh, I don't know how to. Um, uh, it gives us the ground to, to, to go yeah. on in a way. Yeah. I'm sorry, is, is there quite difficult? <laughs> to, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's interesting that, that you're actually pointing out that there's a different way of, you know, that different places, different countries have different ways of engaging or using this idea of theory as a tool. Um, yes, in fact, I was uh, also very interested in the discussion of yesterday where you compare the, uh, the schools uh, that are more uh, like uh, scientific uh, based uh, and the, the polytechnics uh, and uh, the, the school that have uh, an artistic practice uh, developed in uh, different ways. And uh, this is uh, certainly a very interesting uh, topic to, to deal with. And I think that you three actually bring that, that bring bring that up really really nicely together. I, I don't know what you do. You have a um, a comment, Serda? Yeah, I I think in our case we sort of as a first thing we very consciously define sort of the museum itself as the context. So not taking precedence from outside, but really seeing using the museum and all the ideas that are embedded embedded in its architecture as a starting point for, um, for the research and the design. But then the museum itself, as it's a collection of building parts from different times, was also an entry into, into ideas about museum building um, from the last hundred years in a way. And, and we also studied that with students, like how, are, how did ideas about how you exhibit art and what the museum is in, within the city and how did that get translated into this building? So in a way, just as sort of the fragment was an entry into the building as a whole, the museum, the specific museum was also a sort of entry into ideas about museum building and, and the theories surrounding yeah. Uh, that. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, that is so interesting. I, I mean, I find it really, and I think it is the first place that we've been, that we've been able to actually bring this discussion of the theoretical context into play. And I, I think that, um, in the second half of our session, um, we can continue that discussion um, because, yeah, I think it, 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 it's enacted in different ways. So, and I think that's a great place to finish.